with the passage of AB 2020. Raise your hand if you've read AB 2020 from front to back. Oh my God, we have Pam Epstein in the house who's gonna be doing a legal deep dive into temporary licenses, cannabis events, uh, something that happen, happened fairly often in 2017, uh, 2018, a lot of the consumption events you all know and love came to a screeching halt. Uh, Pam's here to explain why, but to explain why things are about to change. And on our panel, we have a whole bunch of cannabis event operators uh, in the state of California. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pam. She's gonna do a little legal deep dive with everyone, and then I'm gonna do the, uh, the business side of running events with the panel. So Pam. Welcome, everyone. I think it's interesting to set up the conversations you're going to hear from the operators up here who have lived through the challenges, who have learned throughout the implementation period of what is now the MAUCRSA, and um, have persevered through that and are going to kind of take us through that journey through what living this ever-changing legal landscape was with a lens on what we have to look forward to in 2019 and why it may seem like a small victory. It is uh, going to be a watershed moment to get us back to the events culture that California was known for under Prop 215. Um, so to set us up for that, California was one of the, was the first state to take decriminalized action in 1996 with the Compassionate Use Act. That then became uh, the medical marijuana program with SB 420 um, that gave you the cooperative collective model and the 2008 Attorney General guidelines. And we lived under that system for quite a long period of time until late 2015 when there was a trio of bills. Interesting to note, there were over, I think, 80 legislative bills this past session, so we've come a long way. And that gave us MRSA, which then gave birth to what statutory uh, structure we currently have. And under that structure, predating that structure under the 215 model, you would simply have an event and you would check recommendations, patient recommendations, and you would have brands that showed up because they were properly formed collectives and people would join the collectives and they were able to have this robust interaction with cannabis and the operators and the manufacturers that were truly engaged in this process. What happened when we had infrastructure come into play is you had the creation by one of the three regulatory agencies, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, developed an event organizer licensee and special event licenses. And when the, MAUS, uh, when the MAUCRSA came into effect, it set a, a very specific precedent about where these events were allowed to be located. They were allowed to be located on agricult district agricultural associations and county fairgrounds. District agricultural associations, there are 58 throughout the state, and they are state agencies. However, these state agency, these are like little state agencies, are housed within other jurisdictions. And because when we had and the MAUCRSA come into effect, you had to have local authorization. Local authorization was given to you by a local jurisdiction that was defined as a city, county, or city and county. And that did not include a district agricultural association. So as these event organizers went to go get their license and, and engage in a compliant activity, they went to where you naturally think that you would go as you are a state agency. And we'll hear, I'm sure, about the trials and tribulations with Chalice. I, in fact, worked with the 28th DAA because they believed that they had the jurisdictional control over their borders to regulate what events took place there. And that's an important distinction, right? You would think that they don't pay city tax. They get all of their permits from the state that now all of the sudden where you are located, where this district agricultural association is located, and it's in the name, they serve a larger district. They serve everybody in the state of California 
to the, the means of, of granting them access to agricultural activity. We are, in fact, in cannabis, an agricultural product, right? So this is in the wheelhouse of what these district agricultural associations are used to doing. They put on events. They have liquor licenses. They don't go to the jurisdiction at any other point to ask for permission. And why is this so critical? Because you may have a favorable DAA who has had positive experiences with cannabis operators that then have to go and ask a city for permission. And that city may be unfavorable to cannabis. And that then creates a, a conflict that was unresolvable until we got to AB uh, 2020. So an event organizer goes, they go through the disclosure process, they get their license, and then they have to go and get that event license, that temporary event allowance. That's when we run into the problems at the fairgrounds. And moving forward, as we talked about, 2020 gives you the right, gives these operators the right to be able to hold events not on DAAs or county fairgrounds, but anywhere where they can get local authority and local authorization. At first, that seems like you're going to be able to have an event anywhere. What this does is it allows for events to take place not at those two specific locations, but you have to gain permission to do so. And once you give the right to regulate, you will see cities and counties stepping up and wanting to regulate. So what does that mean? Are you going to have to get some sort of permit? We hope so. What I always advise and what I know that these operators will likely do is to go to those cities with a request. Know what kind of event you want to have. Know where you want to have that event. Know whether or not there is alcohol that's going to be served at that event because that is a critical component of the events culture that is going to continue to experience pain points is how do you have an event where you have two substances that are heavily controlled. And we've seen the state and the governor take a very specific position, A, that you cannot infuse cannabis to the, with any alcohol. More to the point than that, the regulations flushed out that you cannot even have dealkalized beer or wine or anything that would confuse the consumer. So you can see that we're going to have strategic pain points to learn how to navigate between having a premise and what that premise means and whether or not you're at a facility that serves alcohol and whether or not that facility could potentially be jeopardizing their liquor license or their insurance policies or any other business license that they currently have. So what is the difference, you may be thinking, between a consumption event and a event that you can consume at where you can also purchase cannabis. Because that's sort of also what we're talking about. Where the, we've seen in the last year to two years, these pop-up events that occur where you see vendors that are there that are exchanging product. Um, if that product has not gone through a retailer, if that event is taking place in a non-private residence even then, with the track and trace coming online, you're not going to be able to hold those events. Those are non-compliant events. California says there is no, or the city of Los Angeles says there is no consumption, right? They do not have time yet to regulate this. So there are no consumption lounges that are regulated. There are no consumption on site with a dispensary. These are things that need to be flushed out. In Southern California, the only people that are, the only city jurisdiction that is moving in that direction is the city of West Hollywood. And they are issuing specific consumption licenses and dispensaries that are allowed to consume on site and sell. So you can see the more they, they have the bandwidth to regulate, these jurisdictions will start to do so and they will regulate events in the same manner and practice. Because West Hollywood is looking at the events issue now that they want to get ahead of it because they are a progressive city. Other cities you're going to see in Southern California move much faster, unfortunately, than the city of Los Angeles. 
will be out in the desert where you're going to see uh, Coachella, Palm Springs, <laughs> Desert Hot Springs. They're all going to issue events. Um, up north, you're going to see this play out much quicker as um, Oakland and Sacramento already have said, we're just going to process events in the same and similar fashion. I know Davis, the city of Davis is also very much looking into that. So if you want to support these event organizers, I say please be responsible when you're at the events. These is, you know, we're learning to walk, crawl, run it out here in California. And as we want to develop the ability to curate events where you're going to be able to see demonstrations of cannabis products being made and then ingest them without having to have final form product through the quality assurance and quality control mechanisms that we have. The best way to do that is to be a compliant attendee at these events. So I would ask you to do that and really listen and support these operators as they tell you how they traverse these very tumultuous waters over the last two years.